Heavenly Father, as we take up the study this morning, uh, begin another week of studies here, we ask that you grant us the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit, that you pour your latter rain out upon us, that you would accompany this message uh, wherever it might go on the internet, that your people might be edified and strengthened by it. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm identifying four lines in Daniel's last vision. Um, that we'll find their application in verses 40 to 45. The beast, the papacy, I'm saying that there is a line about the papacy in terms of modern Rome being a kingdom, but there's also a line about the popes uh, of that kingdom, and by the popes in plural, I mean that in the prophecy of Fatima, which I'm saying is connected with this history, you have a struggle between a good pope and a bad pope. Um, and we can see these popes in the four Roman rulers in Daniel 11. Uh, it was brought up, well, you're saying that uh, John Paul II is Augustus Caesar and that the vile Tiberius Caesar is the current pope. Is his name Francis? And, but what about the pope in between the two and my point here is that this is about Fatima. So Fatima is talking about the history of the struggle between a good pope and a bad pope. And the pope that retired, he would be in the good pope category. He was a, a John Paul II guy. And I have no confidence in their prophecy, but the Fatima prophecy, before Pope John Paul II died, the Catholic prophetic interpreters that were looking at the prophecies of Fatima they always gave two options about the good pope in the prophecy of Fatima. Either John Paul II died and then was resurrected and restored by Jesus when he returns, or that he would go into exile and then come out and be restored. So he did die, and this other pope kind of gives them the, the point of reference for someone coming out of exile. And it's, it's not a, a, a minor issue in the history of the papacy. Popes don't retire. Popes are popes till they die. So this is a, a real anomaly. And so is Francis, for he's the first Jesuit pope. He's the vile pope. Maybe he's going to die because he hasn't been going to meetings here the past few, few days with this coronavirus going on. Uh, one of the leaders in Iran just died from it. So uh, if that's the case, I would expect to see a, a pope replacement right away that was also this socialistic, communist, liberal type pope. Um, and then the dragon power, I'm saying the story line of the dragon power as the storyline, if that's the right way to say it, in the beast is Fatima. The storyline of the dragon power is the king of the south. It's a struggle from 1798 when the king of the south delivers a deadly wound until the Sunday law where the king of the south is removed from history permanently, okay? And just as Fatima had a struggle between a conservative and a liberal, between the good pope and the bad pope, the black pope, the white pope, uh, this story, the present truth, fulfillment of this story now of the king of the south is a struggle between Trump and Putin and I know that Trump, the United States, is not the king of the South. But it's a, it's a shirt tell relative. Because of atheistic France, who was the king of the South, um, in the time that it's becoming atheistic France, during the time period of the French Revolution, this is the American Revolution time period, and France typifies the United States. It was a two-horned power. The United States is a two-horned power. Uh, it's France that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. The United States is going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. So I'm not saying that Trump is the king of the south, but there's a close relationship prophetically with Trump. And Putin is now the king of the south, the head of Russia. And they have a struggle until they both come to their end. Russia comes to its end December 25th, 2021 at the Sunday Law. And of course, this is where the United States comes to its end as the Sixth Kingdom Bible prophecy. This is where both Balaam and the ass fall. Um, this is the fourth trumpet when you're putting the trumpets in there and, and that kingdom falls there. 
So there's several fallings. And the third line that's in there is the false prophet. And the storyline there is the Constitution of the United States. And the struggle is between Republicans and Democrats. And uh, one of the, on all three of these storylines, you can see conservative, conservative, conservative versus liberal, liberal, liberal in, in the various ways that those manifest. You know, a liberal Catholic, Catholic is not uh, fully the same. It's pretty close as a, a liberal Democrat or uh, communist Russia. With, with, what, with Bernie Sanders now seem to be the, the person they're going to elect to run against Trump, you can almost argue that the Democrats have fully become uh, Russian, all right, because the guy is pro-Russia. Uh, and then I'm saying with the 144,000, these are all kingdoms. This is the kingdom of the beast, the kingdom of the dragon, the kingdom of the false prophet. Um, and this is the kingdom of the 144,000. And I'm saying the storyline, the line in here that allows us to see the ebb and flow of, of God's people in this history is broken into three points, prophet, priest, and king, because Christ is all three of these things. He's a prophet, priest, and king. And, of course, this is a prophet, this is a priest, counterfeit priest, and this is their king. Okay, so in breaking up the 144,000 into these three lines, you're seeing a counterpart here in this threefold union. And of course, that's one of the conclusions once we get familiar with these lines that we draw is that uh, the story of these popes illustrate what goes down on down. Uh, down what goes on here in the movement of the 144,000 in terms of the Omega apostasy. Okay, go ahead. Why is, the, um, why is the beast the priest? Why is the papacy the priest? Uh, that's standard understanding. It's a counterfeit priesthood. Um, if you go um, to the the chart that preceded this, that's, that's hanging in the office, the pioneer chart that preceded this one, uh, down here, um, when they're dealing with the daily, they have a really nice illustration that got left off the chart about um, the papacy, papacy as a priest sacrificing. The sacrifice was paganism. That's the story of Daniel 8. It's a priesthood. It's a counterfeit priesthood. And... Um, it's, it's destruction, too, has to do with who it is. It's, a, a, it's burned with fire, and its flesh is eaten. Um, that's from an impure priest. Anyway, it's, it's definitely a counterfeit priesthood, um, the Catholic Church. Um, and so what we'll look at when we get this all in place, I have some more planks to put in place before we go there, is, is we'll look at... The, Let's look at just in advance, go to Daniel 11, a, a few things just to make sure that you're following the logic here. And then we'll get back into the notes we were using last time. The notes we are using, for those of you that are watching on the internet, are these notes called Daniel's Last Vision. But the last time I spoke... I have an untitled set of notes that I worked, was working through that we're going to try to get through today. Um, it's nine pages long, and it begins with a, a long passage from Testimonies, Volume 5, which we've already read last time. Bege begins with the decree, which is to go forth against the people of God, would be very similar. So we're going to return to this one today. But we still haven't finished saying everything we're going to say about Daniel's last vision. And I actually have one other quote I may get to today that isn't in your notes. But in Daniel 11, um, in verse 23, just to give an idea of what we're talking about, in verse, let's go to verse 14. In verse 14, of Daniel 11, it says, "...in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south." Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish a vision, but they shall fall. 
this extra quote I have here today is for verse 14. It's from Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, page 255, DNR, 255. If I want it on the app, it is D-A-R. There is giving me a hard time today. 255 to 257. For, unfortunately, he was right this time, okay? So, <laughs> commenting on verse 14, Uriah Smith Oh, it's not, it's just, you don't have this, don't, don't look for it. This is just something I brought in to make a, a real quick point. Um, commenting on verse 14 is the first place that Rome gets mentioned, but that's all, that's all that happens is it gets mentioned um, as the robbers of thy people. It's not yet coming into power. And what I want, okay, in this... This would be in page 256, paragraph 2. It says, this was 200 B.C. It says, Rome spoke and Syria and Macedonia soon found a change coming over the aspect of their dream. The Romans interfered in behalf of the young king of Egypt, determined that he should be protected from the ruin devised by Antiochus and Philip. This was 200 B.C. So Rome, the pioneers had a principle that a power doesn't get addressed in scriptures until it comes in contact with God's people. And Rome really hasn't come in contact with God's people yet. But here in history, Rome is going to babysit over the king of Egypt. I think a six-year-old boy has become the king. And Antiochus and Philip want to conquer him. But Rome stands up to protect him. And then in verse 14... Um, it mentions the robbers of thy people, which is Rome. They're the ones that are going to fall. So I, I just want to trace a line here. And then if you go to verse 23, it says, After the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. And this league is 161 to 158. There's two different historical events that mark this league. They reach out to Rome in 161 and secure uh, the paperwork, but they don't use the paperwork to help them against an enemy and war until 158, okay? Um, so in here, this is where Rome is becoming uh, connected to God's people. This is where the story of pagan Rome would be marked, but we're saying that Rome establishes the vision in this passage and that this is speaking about a history where papal Rome uh, will come, come on the scene. So I just want to throw a couple of things in here in verse 23 just to give you an idea of how we're applying this. The pioneers, Uriah Smith would apply this to pagan Rome, verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. We dealt with a little bit of that. There was a league made in the Old Testament with the Jews um, by a deceitful people that dressed up like they came from hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And they just really didn't want to get destroyed when ancient Israel came in the promised land and they deceived him. So the Jews were forced to honor that contract, that league with them, and they did. They didn't kill them, but they made them the burden bearers for Israel. Um, and here we once again see a league with a, um, a deceit involved, and they're going to become strong with a small people, okay? When we take this, it'd be after this time period, they're going to become strong with a small people, and... Uh, my argument is I went, I went in and looked at small and great. In the scriptures, um, the word small um, is often used with the word great. You know, rich and poor, small and great. But more often than not, this particular Hebrew word that's translated as small is not the Hebrew word that's translated small with small and great. This means little or few, okay, which is, it's still small. Um, and in... 
in, uh, in ancient history, in the way that um, Uriah Smith would describe it, he's going to talk about the relationship that Rome has as it rises to power with the Jews, the small people. Okay? But we have to apply this at the end of the world, and what I'm saying is the small people at the end of the world that the papacy is going to use is the issue of minority rights. Okay? Uh, minority race, minority sexual preference, and any other minority that I'm not thinking of now, that this is the issue that the, the current pope, this vile pope, is using. It's the issue that's, that's being hammered out in the, the liberal side of things in the United States, um, in the political process. And all of you know that it's, it's a present issue. Um, He's going to become strong with a small people. He's going to use that issue. He shall enter, verse 24, peacefully upon the fattest places of the province. And what's a fat place? Rich. Rich, okay. He's going to enter into the United States and the other rich countries, into the Western world. He's going to conquer them. Um, and, of course, he's already in the United States, but he's going to conquer the fattest places, uh, places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. And he shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, riches, yea. He shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. And this time begins at the Battle of Actium. And we've put that previously at the Midnight Cry, the, the Battle of Actium, 360 years, takes you to the Sunday Law. But there's a Battle of Actium repeated at the Sunday Law, 360 years, takes you to the close of probation. Uh, this is why the midnight cry is repeated. So um, he's going to do this work for a time, and it's going to begin in earnest at the midnight cry Sunday law and at the Sunday law of Daniel 11, verse 41. The first period of time will be in the United States. The second would be um, the world. And he's going to do that which his fathers have not done, um, the papacy has never used minority rights as an issue to try to take the world captive. Go ahead. There in that verse, when it's saying that he shall uh, scatter among them the prey, the spoil, and the riches, that scattering of the prey, the spoil, and the riches goes along with him um, being strong with the small people because what it says to me at least, uh, it's implying that this distribution of wealth. Right. That's, that's part of the liberal agenda. Absolutely. He's going to scatter the prey. He's going to take... And we've, we've taught that from the beginning. There comes a point in time where the papy, papacy takes control of the economic structure of the world. Um, that's Daniel 11, um, 42 and 43. And he's going to redistribute the wealth in agreement with liberal theology or liberal philosophy. Yeah, that's how I understand it as well. But let's jump to verse um, 32. Uh, we understand that in verse 31, the last phrase, shall place the abomination that make it desolate, is identifying when the papacy was placed on the throne of the earth in 538, and it began to rule for 1260 years. It ruled supremely for 1260 years, and this was typified by pagan Rome ru ruling supremely for 360 years. So this 1260 year period is identifying once again the midnight cry period, the history of the image of the beast in the United States and the history of the image of the beast in the world. Okay, he's just been placed upon the throne at the midnight cry. He's going to be placed upon the throne, the threefold union at the Sunday law. And then you have the image of the beast testing time. So verse 32, it says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, Okay, so it's Sunday law issue, that's, that's covenant. The, the Sabbath is the covenant that's getting broken right there, so that would fit in both places. Shall he corrupt by flatteries? Um, and this is the modus operandi that he uses to uh, win people over is flattery. Um, making promises, if you, know, you do this for me, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. So this is where the controversy comes. This is where the midnight cry message is 
swelling and opposing the raising up of the image of the beast, first in the United States, then in the world. There's a, a controversy going on now between the message and the history that's taken place. Verse 33, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by sword and by flame and by captivity and spoil by spoil many days. That's four numbers, okay? Four things. And four, more often than not, is talking about a progressive destruction. So if you start this history at the midnight cry Sunday law and take it to the Sunday law, then it's talking about a progressive destruction destruction of the United States. If you start this history at the Sunday law of Daniel 11 verse 41 and take it till Michael stands up and human probation closes, it's once again talking about a four-step progressive destruction of the entire world. That's what's going on and in this history um, sword, flame, captivity, and spoil. Um, and this speaks to what we understand about the midnight cry. Before the Sunday law, Trump's going to set up a dictatorship. It's going to be in that history, and this is where the persecution is going to start. Um, you have a nuclear attack in Nashville that takes the United States by surprise, and their information gathering machines going to very rapidly pull together everyone that knew about that advance in advance, and persecution is going to begin right then and there. There's no way around that. Um, verse 34, Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little ho help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And if you get into the, yes? When you have sword, flame, captivity, and spoil, you're, you're applying that literally, but you can take that. So no, I'm applying it more, uh, yeah, you can apply it literally, but I'm more saying that it's the number four which identifies a progressive destruction. That's symbolic. But yeah, because the verse up at, above that when you're saying the redistribution of wealth is a spoil, so you're saying some people are going to fall by socialist doctrines, some people are going to be captive in the debt, maybe. Yeah, you're going to have a, you're going to have an argument going on now between the flame, which flame is correct, whether the word of God which is the sword, I mean, you, you can take Well, flame usually means martyrdom. But you're That's talking like about the like message, okay, that it worked there too. You're having a foul, false Lateran message yep. in conflict with the two, true Lateran message. Okay. And it's not just literal. It's all the above. But if it's during the midnight cry period, then that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like you're seeing this a little bit. Is there a specific point when it starts? Or can yeah, you start it starts at the before? Sunday law that begins the image of the beast testing time. It starts on July 18th. 2020. Okay, so if it started on July 18, 2020, that would be a war. A sword can be a symbol of a war. A sword can be a symbol of a spiritual war if it's the message. Um, by flame, well, July 18th, there may be a flame there. Uh, nuclear strike, but also it can mean persecution, You're the flames of persecution, and it could mean the message. Captivity, um, it's that midnight cry that you're going to be arrested and put into captivity, and by spoil, um, there's the flattery. Some people are going to get offered enticements to come over to the wrong side of the issue. But that's what I don't understand. If you're, if you're marking that at July 18th, it says, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So what is that portion being marked at? That's when the priests begin to instruct the Levites. That, the Levites are the many. Aren't they? There's 12 priests and 70 Levites. In relationship, in relation to the priests, the Levites are many. Okay. It has been my... conviction that from July 18, 2020 to December 21st, 2020, I mean, just, just December, December 25th, 2021 is a 2520. And so it would seem like the 
uh, it's actually falling, a 525, isn't it? What's that? It's actually 525, right? It's what? broken into a 252 and a one. Anyway, go ahead. I get your point, even if even, okay. even if you're just talking metaphorically. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So um, it would seem to me, I, it looks like the falling by the sword and by captivity and by spoiled many days. That would be the 2520. Yeah. I, I, well. Is it 20, it's, it's more than 252 days from July 18th to December 25th. Yeah. I think it's 525. I think that's one of those inversions. Okay. Okay, yeah. 525 <coughs> is an inversion of 252. Okay, and I think it breaks up into a 252 and a, is it a 178 or, forget what the second period is. But in any case, it's a symbol of the 2520. That's the many so, days, yeah. which that's the 1260. So, you, you know, like with, with ancient Israel, you had the, the 70 years captivity. Yep. They went into that 70 years captivity because they rejected the message. Well, I mean, they were going into that anyway, regardless. I'm just saying you, you have that, but that, that starts when the king of the north comes yes. in, in ancient Israel. So that and then the seventy years, of course, is this twelve sixty, is which is the twenty five twenty, and the, the twelve in this passage, the first application is the twelve sixty of papal rule. So yeah. we're taking this twelve sixty of papal rule and bringing it to our history, and I'm saying that it's doubled. It's the history from the midnight cry to the Sunday law of Daniel eleven verse forty one. It's a twelve sixty in the United States that's followed by a twelve sixty in the world from the Sunday law of Daniel 11 verse 41 until the universal Sunday law. Which is a 2520. Which is, would be a 2520. 1260, 1260 is 2520. And to prove that as a second witness uh, in regards to that as in the United States, you can go to Ezekiel 14. In the four sword four judgments. Four sword judgments, verse uh, 21. Okay, keep your finger there, go to Ezekiel 14. Now, I want to just point out here, I, w I was attempting to do just a brief overview of this of this line to familiarize us with the line before at some point we come back and do it in detail, but uh, the Lord's in control. I'm not complaining. Um, verse 14, 1421. Uh, Ezekiel 1421. And it says, For thus saith the Lord, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem? Where is Jerusalem? Glorious land, USA. You say that from time to time, but I, and I get it. But, but where is Jerusalem? That's not right. That Adventist church. Oh, that, that, okay, you're probably both right. I don't want to say oh, you're not right. You're did, saying when did where did Ezra get on the okay, first day of the fifth okay. month? Yeah, that's midnight. I mean, no, midnight cry. A midnight cry is Jerusalem. Okay, right? He gets to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, and that's August 15th, 1844. So that's the, qu that's the type question I was asking. You can't know the answer unless you know my question. So I was misleading you guys. All right. By four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noise and beast and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. Um, so there's a second witness to that. Progressive destruction. And now go back to uh, Daniel 11. Now when they shall fall, who's falling? Yeah, that's like, that was my next who's falling? What have we always taught until Parminder came on board? Now I don't know what's taught, but we used to teach. And what was our definition of the 144,000? The definition of the 144,000 used to be that we're not real certain, but those people that have the seal of God when human probation closes are the 144,000 because they're the ones that have the seal that will not taste death. Then it was one of those things that he started getting all cloudy and mushy. Okay, so I'm prepared to defend the idea that the 144,000 are those with the seal of God when Michael stands up. They're not going to die. All right. But that means that before Michael stands up, people with the seal of God can what? 
they can die. Okay, so how is it that someone that is, who understands, and in the context of someone that understands, in this very last vision of Daniel, it's defined as the wise understand. Okay, how is it that a wise can fall? And I'm saying that in death, Okay, the wise can fall in death. And verse 34 says, Now when they shall fall, they shall be hopen with a little help. Who gets hopen with a little help? God's people, right? Well, it be God's people that are getting help, but what particular group of God's people? And, and here, here's my logic, so you can follow me. Sister White's clear that the blood of martyrs is as seeds. When the wise die in this history, their blood is used to help people that are making decisions come to the right side of the issue. Okay, so I, I, we don't have a great deal of evidence that there's going to be a lot of martyrs between the midnight cry in the United States and the Sunday law in the United States. But in Maranatha, page 199, Sister White says, in the Sunday law time period of Daniel 11.41 until human probation closes, there will be many martyrs. The definition of fall there in the Strong's is to totter or waver through weakness of the legs, especially the ankle, by implication to, to falter, stumble, faint, or fall. So it doesn't necessarily mean death. death. Yeah, it sounds more like compromise it's that way, but it can mean yeah. death too. So if you take from verse 32 to where you just got, you've got a people that know their God, they're strong, they understand, they instruct. They do exploits. They do exploits, they fall by the sword flame, captivity and spoil, and when they fall they get a little help. And then that last little, that last little thing just throws it all off. I mean, you're do, they're doing all these wonderful things. They're falling and they're being helped when they fall down. And now they've got a bunch of people clinging to them with flattery. Uh, Why okay. would you have someone clinging to you with flattery if no, you're... It's, it's, okay, first of all, it's cleaving to them with, with flatteries. Okay. And what, what this is, I have, I've understood this for years, but this, I believe, is referring to is, like she says in Great Controversy, the chapter, um, the final warning, that some of them will be offered pos uh, positions of, uh, of of influence, bribes, and stuff. You know, if 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 we give you this, will you give up your faith? We've seen that. We've seen that in the Omega movement history, but we've seen it in the history of the 1260 years, which this is. And that's what it is. Is it? You're in a in the midnight cry time period, whether it's the midnight cry time period in the United States or the midnight cry time period in the world, you're in an argument, a controversy between truth and error. And one of the characteristics that we've already mentioned of the Pope is that he uses flatteries to corrupt. Okay, he's, that's what he's doing here. Many of them will, they will cleave to them with flatteries. It's flatteries yeah, to, to, to draw them away from the truth. Um, how, how does that fit when we typically teach under persecution is when you get the greatest power to do right? Why then would flatteries, but, and I'm willing to drop it, I'm just trying to think it through in my mind. Why would it entice you? You're dying a, for your It's faith. a separation process that's going on between two classes of worshipers. And one of the things we used to always teach when we were doing Daniel 11, 40 to 45, that you get a reference from in Testimonies, Volume 9, and it is that the final movements will be rapid ones. Um, as we read it and we think about 1260 years of history, typifying this history, we may think that from July 18, 2020 to December 25, 2021 is a long period of time, but it isn't, and it's a big crisis. It's a, it's a purging process. It's a, it's, a separation, and it's talking about the the way the separation process happens. Just one quick thing: all of what you see there, and, and I know you know this, that the first application of this is the Dark Ages. Right. So all we all we need to do is is take this, study the experience of God's people in the Dark Ages, and there you have our experience. Yeah, and what we're de describing here. 
is just what was what going on in the Dark Ages. When she's talking about the martyrs of the Dark Ages, what does she say their blood was? Seed. Seed. Yeah. Um, and she talks about the flatteries that the papacy used during the Dark Ages. So we're not inventing any real new profound insights. Um, but in the next verse, it identifies what I just told you. Verse 35, And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them mm -hmm. and to purge and to make them white. Mm -hmm. Okay, three-step testing process. Even to the time of the end, for it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. <laughs> for that that is determined shall be done. He's going to prosper until Michael stands up. And at that point, the indignation is going to be accomplished. Yes? So you laid verse 35 right over the top of 33, and it's like a repeat and enlarge. It's the same thing that's going on right there. Yeah, I think verse 36 is switching now to, to describe the activity of the king from verse 31 through his self-exaltation during this history. He's, you've seen the... the together, though, in the 1260, when people look at it, it's all just together. This is what happened during this time frame. So it, it's not like it's chronologically. It's just this is the things that are going on. Verse 33 says many days. That's the 1260. It's talking about verse 32 and 33 and verse 34 and 35 has to be in that history because verse 34 says now when they shall fall and it's taken you back to the previous verses explaining this fourfold desolation now in verse 36 and it says and the king so now it's going to talk about what the king's doing in this history and he's going to prosper till the indignation be accomplished and we understand for the papacy, that was the end of the 2520 against the northern kingdom that ended in 1798. But he receiving a deadly wound there is typifying where he comes to his end and none to help in Daniel 11 verse 45. So that indignation that is accomplished is different. What is that indignation? <coughs> and we dealt with this briefly. We went to Revelation 18, and we've seen the kings of the earth standing afar off, looking at the smoke of her burning. Um, and who is it? It seems to be that that's a nuclear strike. And it may lead you to think, well, Islam nukes the Vatican. But that's not what Revelation 17 says, is it? Go to Revelation 17. Keep your finger in Daniel 11. And don't make me explain why the ten kings would... I understand why they would. Um, but verse 16 of Revelation 17 says, And the ten kings which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, <coughs> and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. And then in chapter 18, you see the papacy being burnt with fire. So who is it that burns her with fire, whatever that fire might be? It's the ten kings. So that, if that's a nuclear attack on the Vatican, it probably, it's, it's the UN. It's not Islam. The UN's become so frustrated with the Pope at that point. I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I do too much speculation already. Back to... Pardon, boy? The UN's about peace. Yeah, the UN's about peace. And the Ten Kings are always the symbol of the persecuting power. They're the persecutors. And yet they're being lifted up as the keeping in the, in the, 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 the Church of Ephesus in Smyrna, it was, the, it was pagan Rome that was doing it. And those Ten Kings are the ones that were allowing the papacy to do it through the Dark Ages. They're the ones that bring the persecution. At the direction of the Pope. But they're the, what do you mean? They're the persecuting power or they're the persecuting structure? The false prophet is the arm and the papacy is the boss. The false prophet ends at the Sunday law and becomes the head of the United Nations. But the United States is still being used. Yeah, as it's the still going to be. Its, milita it, it's military arm. might is what's going to. 
persecuted. In the Western world, and Sister White says in the old world, it's Rome. That would be NATO. You have something, Daniel, before we move on? I'm going back to verse 37. Yeah. I'm never going to get to these notes today. Just very, very Sounds quickly. Like the Democrats do. And Sounds like something the Democrats do. Okay. Persecute. I, I apply this. You apply to, what? Uh, this passage from Great Controversy 589 to 90. Uh, 90 I, I won't read the whole thing. I apply this to the papacy and the UN. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. So their response for that, when they wake up to who has done that dirty work, is... Yeah, because when you... This, death. That passage here in Revelation 8, 17, uh, 17 in 18, about eating her flesh. You take that and put that with uh, Zechariah 14. 14. And it's you have this evidently nuclear attack that happens the same, <coughs> very similar description about flesh and, and their eyes being burned out and all that Consumed sort of thing. Holes. And in that very same passage, it, it speaks of uh, everybody on the earth, all the wicked turning against each other. Yeah, okay, well maybe when we take, go through Daniel 11 in a more thorough fashion, we'll go there. Uh, and how did Jezebel die? They burned her. Or no, they ate her flesh. The dogs ate her flesh. And who are the dogs? Who are the dogs the in ten, Scripture? The ten. It's the Ten Kings. Yeah. It's the Confederacy. Um, I'm in verse 37 of Daniel 11. Nor shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. I mean, how, how clear is that? The God, he's, he's switching the gods of his fathers. He's switching it now. To, when we get to verse 38 and 39, he's going to worship Pachamama, which is just the modern adaptation of the Virgin Mary, or Nimrod's wife. But he's going to use global warming to do his, his thing. But what is Genesis 3.16? That is... You want to read that? Genesis 3.16. This is the first mention of the desire of woman. <laughs> Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. Oh, she's supposed to be in submission to her husband. And that's the first mention. So if you go back to verse 37 of Daniel 11, it says, Nor shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. It's emphasizing this unsanctified feminist movement that the current Pope of Rome is also promoting with this liberal agenda. Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate shall he honor a God of fortresses. It says forces, but fortresses. I meant to bring, I didn't think I'd get to this level. I intend to bring, when we go through this in detail, two Babylons by Alexander Hislop and show you the picture of the goddess of fortresses. It's the, the goddess of many breasts, but on the top of her head, she has a crown that is shaped like the top of a, a, the palace walls. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a fortress crown. She's the goddess of fortresses. And a god whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, and precious stones and pleasant things. Four things. Um, escalating you know, four is either a progressive destruction or a progressing lifting up. So this lifting up of, of this Mother Earth Goddess is progressive. Thus shall he do in most strongholds with the strange God. He's going to connect with most of the leading countries of the world, whom he, she, he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Um, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. What, 
says he shall cause them to rule over many. He's going to use this political argument to take control of the world. He shall cause them. That's such a strange <coughs> what we He shall cause them to rule over many. Because it seems like those them right there are those those people that he's in. You were just well, the verse says, look, Thus shall he do in most strongholds. The strongholds are fortresses. Okay, so the the United States is a stronghold. Yeah. England is a stronghold. France is a stronghold. Okay, so most of the strongholds the papacy is going to take control of. With a strange God, he's going to use global warming and this uh, small people, minority rights, and feminist agenda, uh, not desire of women, to lead the world into an agreement, we think probably on May 14th, and a God whom is in thus, sh who, where was I? 39 in the middle. Whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, he shall cause them to rule over many. He's causing the leaders of the world, the countries of the world, to do his bidding. And that is the relationship of the papacy with the Ten Kings. It's the one that is the head that is pulling the strings. And he's causing the ten kings to rule over many. They are his persecuting power and, and shall divide the land for gain. But I want you to see verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south nuke him. <coughs> when it's time for his end, at the end, it's the king of the south once again that pushes against him, that wars against him. And that's what we're saying about Revelation 17 and 18. The ten kings are the king of the south. And at the, when it's time, so the, even, even moving this into verse 40 is an agreement with where he comes to his end. So what I'm saying is, that's the story of the beast up there, that top line. I'll wait for you guys. That top line. He has a question for you. Okay. He's afraid to ask it. No, I'm not. Uh, don't be afraid, my brother. Just ask it, it for him. It, I don't know if I understand completely. He says, what do you mean when you say... Um, nuke him. Nuke him and the king of the south, Russia, nuclear attack in Daniel 11.40 when he thought July 18th was this nuclear attack. Well, good. That shows... that I'm glad you asked that question. Is that, was that your question? Yeah. Okay. Um... That's a different attack, and I mentioned it. I, I'm not, I can't be positive that it's nuclear. I'm positive that July 18th is nuclear based upon World War II. You can't get away from that. But um, if you follow Balaam, the story of Balaam, Islam's going to strike the United States three times, and at the third time, the ass is going to speak and both the ass and the United States are going to fall. This is 9-11. This is the first time. This is July 18th. And this is December 25th. But Sister White commenting on Christ holding the four winds, there's four holds. It says, hold, 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 hold. Islam's restrained here, here, here. But Balaam says Islam only strikes the United States three times. One, two, three. So Islam evidently has got to strike one more time somewhere in here. Okay, because when it strikes, it's told to hold. And the reason it's holding is that so God's people can be sealed. This can't be the close of human probation because they're being held while the sealing process continues. But down here, at the close of probation, when Michael stands up, there's also a strike. And what we're saying is, in Revelation 18, and it's, it's throughout here, start in verse 9, well, verse 8. Therefore shall her plagues, this is the papacy, come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord who judgeth her, 
And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So it, from, from verse 8 to 10, it's, her judgment comes in a day and an hour, both. But whatever it is, it's a fire that no one wants to get close to. And so my argument is it's a nuclear fire. They're standing afar off. And this is repeated uh, throughout the rest of chapter 18. But where we already looked at in verse 16 of chapter 17, it says, And the ten horns, that's the ten kings, that's the United Nations, which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So it's the ten kings that burn her with fire. It's not, it's not Islam. It's the ten kings. And this is at the close of probation. This is the, the, the indignation that's been determined for her here. I'm saying that this is a nuclear attack, too, based upon the description in chapter 18. They stand afar off. They don't want to get close to that fire. They don't want to get close to the smoke for fear of it. That sounds like nuclear fallout. Um, so this wasn't nuclear, 9-11. This is Islam. It's nuclear. This is Islam. It's nuclear based upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's going to be another strike of Islam to where they get held after the United States falls as a kingdom. I'm not sure where or if it's nuclear. And then this is a, I'm guessing, a nuclear by the ten kings. But the ten kings, this line here, this line here, the story of the popes is illustrated in the story of Fatima. And the story of Trump versus Putin is illustrated in the King of the South. It's a story about the struggle of the King of the South that begins in 1798. The story begins in 1798. The King of the South is France. It moves to the Soviet Union. Then Russia and the United States are going to struggle with one another uh, for, to take control of the world. And the King of the South comes to his end on December 25th, 2021. He comes to his end at the same place the United States comes to his end. Okay, so the King of the South is no more. But right here, what's instituted is the United Nations. And the United Nations is simply an extension, or it's a, it's a dragon power. The King of the South was a dragon power. The dragon moves through different earthly entities. So when I'm getting to verse 40 there, what I'm saying is, and at the time of the end, shall the King of the South push at him, at the time of the end, the king of the south isn't really prophetically the king of the south. It's the ten kings, but they're the king of the south. And the word push means war against, right here. Um, and we went much further. So you're saying that the... Uh, if I understand you, if I'm following you correctly, the king of the south in verse 41 is, the, is not... It will, will then be the UN. Verse 40. Yeah, yeah, verse 40. Yeah, just that first phrase. I just found it interesting that it... That's where it comes to. It's the king of the South pushing it. It's a perfect and circle. It's the same principles as, yeah. as, as Russia, you know, this communistic yeah. they, what, thing. You, got a whole, you have a whole storyline in there. In this, when we get to this, there's a big storyline about Fatima that speaks to the good and bad pope. But there's a big storyline about the king of the South. Okay, and, and one of them is with the collapse of the Soviet Union in in the 1989 slash 91 time period, who was the head of the Soviet Union? Mikhail Gorbachev. What did he do? He immediately took a job at the United Nations. He still works there today. He's still there. So you have in that, that first little illustration of the fall of the King of the South in terms of the Soviet Union, they moved to the United Nations and at the final fall of the King of the South with Russia, it moves to the United Nations. It's still the king of the south at one level. I know this is out of the scope of this study, but then it would beg the question, who is the king of the north at that, that time in verse 40? And 
And the question then is, is who is the king of the north? That's the second coming of Christ. The true That's king of the I north comes yep. and... Yes? So only if you approach it by going chronologically... So you're approaching Daniel 11.40, not disconnecting it like we've done in the past. You, you can still approach it the way we. No, I don't want to. I don't. Wanna, I get what you're saying. I think. No, I'm not saying we're marching right on through verses 40 to 45. I'm just saying that it that happens to be there, and it's because a full we've been circle. Reading all these verses, Daniel 11:23. Now we went down and we got to Daniel 11:40, and we've approached it that way. Okay, you may not remember. Uh, not you, but everyone may not remember. But it's in Daniel's last vision. Okay, this these notes here. I have five points of logic that I'm saying we have to come to grips with to understand this vision. And number four is the time of the end. So I didn't spend any time today talking about the time of the end. I'm saying when we see the times of the ends in Daniel's last vision, it allows us to take that particular point and put it in 1989. Okay, and or wherever it appropriately goes. And then that line extends forward. Okay, so um, we showed when we were doing the time of the end, well, here's a simple one. Is 1798 the time of the end? Yes. Did the papacy receive a deadly wound in 1798? Yes. Therefore, when the papacy receives a deadly wound, what is it typifying? The time of the end. No, forget that. What is the deadly wound typifying? The end of the papacy. Okay, that's Daniel 11, verse 45. He comes to his end with none to help. The deadly wound typified Daniel eleven forty five. So now you can say, if 1798 was the time of the end, what is verse 45? It's the time of the end. Okay, so, so when you get to verse 39 and you're seeing this, this illustration of the work of the Pope, in the history of the 1260 years, if you're looking at it from the pioneer application, when you get to the end of the 1260 years, you're at verse 40, and it says, and at the time of the end, well, that can be 1798, or it can be Daniel 11, verse 45, where he comes to his end and none shall help. How does he come to his end? He gets burnt with fire on one hour and one day. And who does it? Well, the ten kings, but verse 40 says, the king of the south pushes at him, and I'm saying the ten kings are an extension of the king of the south. They're the dragon power. For, just for, that, for the reason that you only gave one proof. You gave two proofs. Gorbachev, he, in the beginning of the history, Alpha and Omega you used. No, the, the, the proof for that is that these three players, these three symbols, the beast, the dragon, and false prophet, all have their own peculiar characteristics. This one is Rome, the beast, and the Bible, spirit of prophecy, history, and Rome itself, all four witnesses, <coughs> will tell you that Rome never changes. That's one of its characteristics. Whereas this one, the United States, its characteristic is that it does change. It begins as a lamb, it ends speaking as a dragon. So the characteristics of this power is different than the characteristics of this power. One of the characteristics of this power is it's always in the city of Rome. One of the characteristics of this power is it's always the United States. But one of the characteristics of this power is that it moves through history. It begins in heaven. It comes to the Garden of Eden. It ends up um, in Pergamos, where Satan's seat is. Then the Romans conquer Pergamos and they take it to Rome. Uh, the dragon's now in Rome, then it divides into ten parts, it's in these ten countries. Ultimately, the premier country of the, the dragon is atheistic France, now it's called the King of the South, transcends to Russia, Soviet Union we thought, then Russia, and it's heading to be the United Nations. But from the rebellion to heaven to the United Nations, that's all the dragon power. All, you could call it, that's why Sister White says, um, in Revelation 12, the dragon is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. Okay, so you could take any of those manifestations of the dragon power throughout history and say it's the dragon. It's the dragon in heaven. It's the dragon that's seducing Eve. It's the dragon in Pergamos. Or 
You could say, it's the king of the south. It's the king of the south. It's the king of the south. Okay, that's, that, it, that's a easy, you can defend that on lots of witnesses is what I'm saying. Okay, l l let's try to get through just a little bit of these notes. My bad for allowing this. No, we can't, we're done. Our, our screen just went red. Um, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the review. We thank you that you're familiarizing us with these lines in Daniel 11 that we can see the implications of the history that we're living in right now. Um, we want to know these things. We want to know them right away uh, that we can be prepared to give a, a clear and concise warning to those that we come in contact with. Uh, we ask a blessing upon our day's work uh, that we have for you, whatever that might be. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.